So today we have a new session of ENT, a 30 minute session and we are going to deal with a topic which is common syndromes of ENT that causes hearing loss. So this is going to be our topic of the day, common syndromes of ENT causing hearing loss. But if somebody is online, I'd like to know if the, uh, if the volume is okay, the audio is okay. As I can hear, it's okay. So, welcome to this session. I'm Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, your ENT educator. Now, there are various ways of dividing the syndromes in hearing loss. This is one of the ways you can divide those syndromes, the common syndromes, between autosomal dominant syndrome autosomal recessive and X-linked and as you can see the autosomal recessive syndromes can be Usher syndrome, Pendred's and Jarville and Lange Nelson syndrome very important ones among the dominant you have Wardenburg syndrome this is very very important next one is also very important Trichot Collins syndrome we all know about this it's discussed very commonly in you know in uh, pediatrics then the rest of them are less important like Stickler syndrome or Brinkio-Otorinal syndrome are less important but Wenderhoff syndrome is another very important one from the ENT point of view because it has autosclerosis and it will discuss this and among the X-link, this one X-link, we have Elpert syndrome, we have Nuri syndrome and Autopalato digital syndrome. This one from the name you can understand or you might you know be able to guess that what this is. So this is one way of dividing the syndromes of uh, ENT or syndrome that causes hearing loss in recessive, dominant and X-link but I always find more comfortable when I divide the uh, syndromes into these three types that is conductive hearing loss, sensory, the one that causes conductive hearing loss, the one that causes sensory neurohearing loss and the one that causes mixed hearing loss and these are some of the important ones. See the conductive hearing loss, most of them they have some kind of facial anomaly you know, and most of the face they develop from the first and the second brinkle arches so anomalies of these arches so the ear, the external, the middle ear also gets uh, disturbed and that's why we get to have uh, conductive hearing loss and the important ones are Tracer Collins syndrome I told you that's a very very important one Down syndrome is a very common disease otherwise also it's discussed in details in pediatrics and in other things also so Down syndrome of course can cause hearing loss, conductive hearing loss Epert's syndrome, another one, and Pierre Robin syndrome, and Wenderhoff, I told you, has autosclerosis, and therefore it's a very, very important disease. Then the one that predominantly causes only sensory neural hearing loss. We have Wardenburg syndrome, this is very important from the, this is discussed in skin, we'll know why. Then Pendert syndrome, again, a general medicine disease, but I'll tell you what, which is Husserl syndrome, in the last one also I told you in the previous slide. And the one disease that can cause both mixed hearing loss, can be Kippelfeld syndrome and Crozon syndrome which is called craniofacial dysostosis. So these are some of the syndromes that we are going to deal with and let's see this list is more important than you know you, from the ENT point of view yes of course from pediatric or general medicine or you know otherwise you may have to know the details of this syndrome but from the ENT point of view if you know this point this slide that you see that which among this syndrome causes conductive hearing loss which among this syndrome causes sensory neural leading loss and which can cause mixed hearing loss that's more than sufficient actually from they don't ask the details from the ENT point of view right and there are two types of questions they may ask you from here a they may just give you randomly four or five uh, syndromes and they may ask you some of them will be from here some not causing hearing loss and they may ask you that which of the following syndrome causes hearing loss or which of the following syndrome does not cause hearing loss so that's a very simple so you have to know the whole list or a little more difficult question can be that they'll give you few from this list and they'll ask you which of the following causes conductive hearing loss or which can cause sensory neural hearing loss or which can cause mixed hearing loss. So that's the kind of question they often ask you. This thing that is 
this chart from the ENT point of view, they usually we are in ENT, we are not bothered which is autosomal recess, recess or dominant or X-link. We are really not bothered. So we never pay too much of attention from the ENT point of view. They don't ask you these points. So this is, like I said, more important. This slide is more important. So like I said, among these, we'll talk about some of them, not all of them, the important ones, like Trichicolline syndrome. I told you that it's a genetic, obviously, syndromes, most of them are genetical disorders. And so, again, there is a facial anomaly. And as you can see from the, uh, the diagram, a very prominent finding is a downward slope, uh, slanting, you know, eye. This is a very, very prominent thing. And a very small, so microthnia as it's called. And there is going to be a, so ear deformity is there, the external and the middle ear deformity. And therefore, this patient begins to have a conductive hearing loss right from childhood and we have some vision problem also. So, the diagram may be important, but you know that among facial anomalies, uh, when they give you images, it's uh, very confusing at times. So, in, in our this discussion also, you see that some of the syndromes, you really cannot differentiate one from the other one, like Tetra Collins syndrome and we'll know a few others also. So, this is one syndrome that you have to know. Then... Down syndrome, of course, we all know is a trisomy, it's a very, very famous uh, syndrome, very commonly asked that what is a genetic defect is a trisomy of 21, chromosome number 21. And these are few of the problems in this. The list is huge. I mean, Down syndrome can have almost anything, but predominantly you have to know that there's a mental retardation. That's a very important one. That's why, you know, we have to take special care of these children because they are mentally not as well developed as they should uh, you know, a young adult may have a mental iq of a small child so they need proper care like a child and stunted growth these are the two main things that mental retardation and stunted growth and the forehead is the face is flattened the head is small the neck is short as you can see and again there is a slanting eye and usually the ears are small the whole ear not only the external ear or the pinna, even the middle ear is small, and that's why these people they tend to have conductive hearing loss. This may not be such an important syndrome from the ENT point of view, but otherwise, we all know Down syndrome is a very, very important syndrome. Then Eppert syndrome. Now, this is a syndrome which has a skeletal anomalies, not only of the face, skeletal anomaly of the hands and the feet, also. It's affected by, as I said, the first brinkle arch, and the key feature is that. Uh, there is a premature closure of these sutures of the skull base. So, there is a craniosynthosis. As you can see in the diagram, because there is a premature uh, closure of the skull, so the bony structure is not well developed and the skull may look very, very large. And along with this, this child has a hearing loss, which is conductive hearing loss. So, again, the image could be important. But this is another important syndrome that when they ask you that the following syndrome can cause hearing loss, this is another one which is very prominently given, you know, in the uh, choices. So you have to know that Eppert syndrome can really be a syndrome that they ask you in the exam. So remember this one. Then we have Pereira robin syndrome. This is also important one, not so important as compared to the previous one, but yeah, you should know this also Pereira robin syndrome is a general uh, condition which is uh, linked with genetic anomaly. This has been recently established actually, which is not... Yeah, it has been recently established that there is a genetic anomaly of chromosomes 2, 11 and 17. And in this patient, there is a sequence which is called Peyer-Robin sequence, which has three things. There is micrognathia, which, is, which means there is a small jaw. The jaw is small, as you can see here in this image. It's a very small jaw. So obviously, this, the tongue, we all know the tongue is attached to the jaw. So if the jaw is small, the tongue begins to look large. So, glossoptosis means the tongue is large and it because the jaw is not able to support the tongue, so the tongue tends to fall backwards. And that causes the third uh, third uh, picture of the sequence, which is airway obstruction. So, if you if they ask you what is the cause of airway obstruction in a Perry robin syndrome, it's because of glossoptosis, which means the tongue becomes large. It tends to fall out also, but it tends to fall back also. Because the mouth, the oral cavity, because of the small mandible, is small, 
and the tongue is a normal size, tongue otherwise is normal size, but relatively it becomes big. So some of it may be protruding outwards and some of it may be protruding backwards. The one that protrudes backwards tends to cause airway obstruction. But this image is extremely important. Okay. Sometimes in some of the images they may show you that small jaw and with you can see the tongue also. Tongue is slightly tongue protruding out and they may give you a history that this child has a hearing loss or something. Not such a small child cannot complain of hearing loss. Of course, the child has to be little bit bigger to be able to you know, appreciate that hearing loss. So this is another important point you have to remember that in children to diagnose a hearing loss in early stages is very, very difficult. Because for first few months, the child doesn't react to any sound. Doesn't react to any sound, we all know. Third, fourth month onwards, the child starts reacting to any sound. And that to only loud sound. If there is a loud noise, the child gets startled. You know, the child gets startled. Otherwise, the child cannot recognize the sound. When we talk to the child, the child is, does not. We see the child is responding. When you look at the child, you make noise and you play with the child. The child responds and the child is smiling at you. So that's more of a vision. The child recognizes the face due to vision and not so much because of the sound. The child really starts understanding the visioning sound a few months later. I mean, four, five, six, seven, and maybe later. So, in the early stage, we may not be able to diagnose hearing loss. It's very difficult. That's why in some countries they have a, you know, they have a national programs where every newborn child will have to be screened for hearing loss. And these are the countries where the birth rate is very low, very, very low birth rate, and they can afford to, you know, to have such a uh, program where every newborn child has to be screened for hearing loss. But a huge country like ours. And huge population of ours, and the birth rate is so high compared to you know most of the European country. India alone may be having more birth rate compared to all of Europe put together. You know, so it's not practical, and that's why, of course, in higher centers they do go for this kind of uh, uh, things, uh, screening. But in a smaller hospital or regularly, uh, this is not done. So, if you see any of these facial anomalies that I've shown you, then you should suspect a hearing loss or ear anomalies and you should really, you know, uh, go for tests for checking the hearing. Right. Then, Wenderhoff syndrome, this is, I can say, one of the most important syndrome from the ear that they ask in the exam. From the exam point of view, this is extremely important. They ask you very commonly because, why? Because, uh, as you can see, the third point is, it has autosclerosis in it. One of the features is autosclerosis and autosclerosis is an extremely important disease from the ENT point of view and that's why this syndrome also becomes a very important syndrome from ENT point of view. So try to remember this, all the three features, autosclerosis, osteogenesis imperfecta and blue colored sclera. And sometimes they may not uh, tell you that it is osteogenesis imperfecta they may just tell you there are uh, recurrent fractures and multiple fractures. Because of osteogenesis imperfecta, some of these patients begins to have recurrent and multiple fractures. Blue colored sclera and autosclerosis. So these are some of the syndromes which can cause conductive hearing loss that we have done so far. This from the ENT point of view is the most important one, the Wenderhoff syndrome. I'm sure you know also this one. Then we have syndromes causing sensory neural hearing loss and one of them is Husserl syndrome also called Husserl's Helgren syndrome. It's a very uncommon syndrome but among the syndrome that causes sensory neural hearing loss this is very prominent that they ask you this one and Elport syndrome. These are the two Elports can have uh, both conductive as well as sensory neural but this is purely sensory neural hearing loss but it is a very uh, rare kind of syndrome. But this syndrome is more important from the ophthalmology point of view, from the you know, eye point of view. Because along with the hearing loss, which is sensory neural, the patient also has a very important prominent eye disorder, which is retinitis pigmentosa. And we all know retinitis pigmentosa, which is also sometimes called tunnel vision, is a very, very important feature. So, Usher syndrome, you have to know this, not from the ENT point of view so much, but from the ophthalmology point of view. And that's why I always highlight this particular syndrome. Next we are going to talk about is Pendert syndrome. Now again not a very important uh, common syndrome but this is one of those syndrome which has you know uh, goiter swelling in the 
uh, neck, the thyroid gland is swollen, goiter. So if you look at the last paragraph, it is a bilateral sensitive neural ingulus, both sides, and there's a goiter with, so although there's a goiter, but the thyroid level may be normal, it could be thyroid or it may be decreased, hypothyroid. So as you can see in this diagram, you can see there's a swelling in the neck in the child. So this is a very straight away diagnosis of goiter. So if they give you this kind of a, uh, this kind of an image and they ask you that this child has a bilateral hearing loss and they may show you the audiometry. Audiometry is showing sensitive neural, you know, I'm sure you know how to diagnose sensitive neural hearing loss on audiometry where AC, air conduction and BC bone conduction both are below 25 mark and the gap is very narrow. The AB gap is less than 15 decibel. So for those who don't know, you have to attend the lectures or uh, then only you know, but sometime, not in the near future, sometimes I'm going to take a, a special class on YouTube, half an hour session on audiometry. So then maybe you'll know, but then you have to look out for it. So this image is, this kind of image with goiter, with hearing loss, is straight away painted syndrome. It's a mutation. As you can see, it's a mutation on chromosome number 7. The gene is called SLC26A4. So you can remember this name SLC26A4. Not so important, but more importantly, chromosome number is important. It's on the chromosome number uh, 7, the pendant syndrome. Then next one is Warden. This is extremely important syndrome. It's an image-based question. It's a genetic syndrome which has sensory neural loss which is obviously congenital in nature and there is a hypopigmentation. Pigmentation of the skin and the hair is decreased and as you can see this is a very typical, very very typical image of a child with Wardenburg syndrome where you have to notice that this is called you know white forelock. It's called white. You can see this line. White forelock is called. The forelock is white. The rest of it is not normal and this is right from childhood and look at the eye of the child. The eye is also hypopigmented and that's why it looks bluish eye. The eye is bluish which you can see if you notice and you can also see hypopigmented patch on the skin especially in the forehead area. The hypopigmented patch is especially in the just below this forelock and if you can see this child also just below the forelock if you notice very carefully you can see that this area is hypopigmented. So this I'll say is one of a very important syndromes where you have where they can potentially ask you a image based question this is not so much a ENT question this is a skin dermatology question because hypopigmentation is the predominant problem in this patient which is you know the moment you look at the child you can see all these changes this very strange kind of look there is a white forelock there is a hypopigmentation in this area and the blue colored eye Hearing loss is of course the child will complain that I can't hear properly and then when you investigate then you realize this child is suffering from you know, sensory neural hearing loss. So not very easy to diagnose but from the diagram again if they give you this kind of diagram and then again either they can give you a history of hearing loss or they may show you an audiogram image of an audiogram side by side two together and then it becomes very clear that this is Wardenburg syndrome. Then we have, this is a people fail syndrome where you have a mixed hearing loss and it's predominantly a bone disorder. Obviously it's a syndrome with a bone disorder where there is an abnormal fusion of the cervical vertebra. Sometimes two or sometimes three cervical vertebra, they fuse. They fuse together and along with that there is a hearing loss in this child and this is right from the it's a congenital defect of course. Now because the, uh, the cervical vertebra are fused together, so few very prominent thing in this uh, child is that the neck is very short. Obviously, if there is no gap between the vertebra and the vertebra is fused together, then the neck becomes short with a very short no, uh, neck and that's why this hairline looks very low. The hairline is not very low otherwise, it's a normal hairline but because the neck is very short, the hair tends to, it appears as though the hairline is very very short and of course there is a, a mixed hearing loss, conductive as well as sensory neural hearing loss in this child. Then we have Crozon syndrome. This is also called 
craniofacial dysostosis. The other name is craniofacial dysostosis. Again, <coughs> there is a uh, it's another hereditary syndrome in which again the fusion of the bone of the skull is early. Early fusion of the bones, and that's why if you can see this also has craniosynthesis where the head may look very large and the eyeballs the socket is abnormal and the space between the eye is increased the eyes are far apart and this mid face is not very well developed this will, sometimes you can see nasal deformity also plus this patient has a, a mixed hearing loss that is sensory as well as sensory neural as well as conductive hearing loss so once again they can give you an audiometry finding and in audiometry they will give you very prominently the finding of mixed hearing loss so you have to be able to diagnose that and then they can give you a history or they can show you an image of this type as you can see the head is large because of early fusion of the skull bones craniosynthosis and you can see that the distance between the eyeball is really can cases sometimes we call it the eyeball is decreased <clears throat> and if you see the middle of the face the mouth area is not very well done with slow development and this with this kind of image they will show you an audiometry which shows uh, mixed hearing loss so it's a very easy simple lead that this child might be suffering from maybe suffering from Cruzon's syndrome craniofacial dysostosis there is another term craniofacial disjunction you know this is craniofacial dysostosis and there is a term called craniofacial disjunction in craniofacial disjunction it is due to fracture fracture trauma and fracture of the mid face the mid part of the face so this frontal part of the facial bone and the cranial part of the facial bone they separate from each other separation so disjunction you know cranio craniofacial disjunction very clear this is craniofacial dysostosis so don't get confused between these two terms sometimes i have seen that student getting confused between these Crohn's syndrome is a very very different kind of disease right so these are the more important ones and then few points about a less important syndromes like stickler syndrome if you remember it was in that list of you know autosomal dominant disease stickler syndrome was in the list of autosomal dominant disease it's a genetic disorder also known as hereditary progressive arthrophthalmopathy so you can make out it's a bone disease arthrophthalmopathy eye problem but it has a hearing loss which so this is please please note that the hearing loss it could be sensory neural or conductive it's not both together so this cannot be classic qualified under the heading of mixed hearing loss mixed hearing loss we all know is when there is both together when the patient has sensory neural as well as conductive hearing loss together then it becomes mixed hearing loss but this patient will either have sensory neural or a conductive hearing loss both may not be together but in rare cases both can be together also so stickler syndrome can fall into all the three any of the three categories it can be another category of these uh, syndromes with conductive hearing loss category of syndrome with sensory neural hearing loss and category of syndromes with mixed hearing loss really in any of the three you can see this so it will stick out you know how do you remember it will stick out in all the three so look out for this one Elbert's I told you is another very important that they ask in the exam when I told you like Usher's when they ask you which are the following syndrome causes hearing loss or which are the syndrome causes uh, sensory neural loss this also sensory neural loss then Usher's syndrome and Elbert's syndrome are very commonly given these two are almost always there in the you know list of the choices that they give you so remember Elbert's syndrome along with Usher's and both are for uh, sensory neural hearing loss but this is a syndrome genetic disorder with is kidney problems with hearing loss the patient when they have as you can see glomerulonephritis and sometimes end stage kidney disease can be there and some eye problem may be there but hearing loss is again, it's again bilateral hearing loss in this case so Elbert syndrome is other the next one which is Jarvin and Lange and Nielsen syndrome is a rare syndrome. It is autosomal recessive, and the although it is rare, but the hearing loss is 
very high profound hearing loss what is the criteria for profound hearing loss profound hearing loss is the one where the threshold is more than 91 decibel threshold of hearing is more than 91 decibel so almost hearing is in, uh, not there so and this is present right from the birth of the child so when you have a hearing loss right from the birth it's called pre-lingual left pre-lingual means from the tongue lingual pre-lingual left pre-lingual means a child who has never heard the sound and never spoken so if you are born deaf especially profound like this one right from the birth that means you have never heard the sound this child has never heard the sound the child does not know what is sound like and so the child also has never spoken not made any sound because the child will speak make any sound only when the child hears the sound otherwise the child cannot learn how to speak so the child has never heard the sound the child has never uh, spoken anything made any noise and yet and the child is deaf so this is pre-lingual deaf but if the child becomes deaf after the child has heard after few months or years of birth so suppose the child was normal till two years of life or one and a half years and then suddenly became deaf completely deaf by life, for whatever reasons then this is a post-lingual deaf, post-lingual. Post-lingual means the child has, for that one and a half year, the child has heard the sound, the child can recognize the sound at least, and by one and a half years, the child will have spoken some word, papa, mama, something, he, the child just makes some noise. The child has made an attempt to speak out, so that becomes a post-lingual deaf. Now, why I'm saying this? Because most of the children with uh, genetic disorders, with congenital hearing loss, especially profound like this one and bilateral, you have to uh, give hearing aids. That's the only option you have. The only option is hearing aid. And hearing aid has a very poor result in a prelingual. This child is a prelingual child, isn't it? Prelingual deaf. So the result of hearing aid in a prelingual child is very poor. And hearing aid result in post-lingual child is much better. And it's a logical thing. A child who has never heard a sound, child does not know what sound is like, has never made an attempt to speak, and even if you put a hearing aid and give him a sound, suddenly the child starts hearing a noise, starts going inside. The child does not know what is this. It's a new thing. At, at suppose you have put on a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, whatever you have tried, at three years of age. This is the first time the child is hearing any sound and for child it's like a, you know it's like a new thing the child does not know how to react does not know what it is and so that's why i said the results are very very poor not very good post lingual deaf the child the moment the child gives the sound the child can relate you know because child has heard this sound before seen the sound before the child can relate and the child can react differently but in this case along with the profound hearing loss in both the ears right from birth there is heart anomaly the QT interval is increased and sometimes there is arrhythmias and arrhythmias can be life threatening we all know so very bad disease to have arrhythmias can be there and this can really cause serious kind of life threatening situation in this child then we talk about another syndrome brachial auto renal syndrome and from the name you understand there is a normally the brachial arches, brachial arch, and we all know ear develops some first and second brachial arches. Auto is ear, of course, and renal is again, you know, uh, kidney related, you know, renal system. So it's an autosomal dominant disease. It was in the place of autosomal dominant disease, characterized by sensory neurohing loss or conductive or mixed. Again, this is another disease like Stickler. I told you Stickler syndrome can be have any of the three kind of hearing loss can be sensory neural or conductive or mixed. Also, this one break your renal syndrome. But in in this patient, the most important, uh, most common is conductive hearing loss, because the brachial arches malformation is there, and that causes conductive kind of hearing loss most commonly. But because of renal problem and there is increase in urea creatinine level, then patient may begin to have sensory neural loss because of that. You know, secondarily it can happen, and if both are there, then it becomes a mixed hearing loss. So obviously, if if the patient has either sensory neural or conductive or mixed hearing loss, then there has to be a structural defect. One conductive hearing loss is always because of structural defect of the outer middle ear, and inner ear defect can cause sensory neural and mixed. Plus, like brachial arch problems like fistula or cyst, or and of course renal anomaly. So another uh, renal anomaly and 
uh, mild hypoplasia of this uh, either kidney or of the uh, uh, facial bones. Now this is another possible, I am not, I don't have an image of this, but this is another possible image based question where they may show you a child or an individual with some high, you know, small microti as we call it, small pinna or absent pinna or deformed pinna or some fistula here or periodical sinus or tag here, you know, some anomaly of the ear and then they will say you, uh, tell you that this child has a mixed hearing loss or sensory hearing loss and also has some kidney problem, you know, kidney problem they may not say entirely directly that urea and creatinine levels are raised and then they ask you questions based on that. So you should know that it is brachiotorinal syndrome in that case. <clears throat> so these kind of questions they can ask you. So with this, uh, I complete most of the important syndromes related to hearing loss. And I can say, tell you that in the past, say six, seven years, questions based on uh, syndromes with hearing loss have been asked three times. So it's a potential question in future also. And if you know the syndrome that I've told you, then it pretty much covers all the syndromes with hearing loss. The most important thing, like again, I'll mention here, is to know that which of the syndrome causes conductive hearing loss, which are the syndrome causes sensory neurotic loss, and which are the syndrome causes uh, mixed hearing loss. That's the most important from ENT point of view. Of course, from other specialty point of view, you may have to know other things also, the other, you know, uh, other features of the syndrome. So, syndromes related to other diseases of the throat and nose will take in future. We'll talk about sy other syndromes as you know, every, every I think, uh, now on every week we'll have one small session only on syndromes. So, we'll cover all the important syndromes, but I don't think you'll get any comprehensive book of ENT where all these syndromes are given in this way. You can check any book of ENT, not only uh, undergraduate, even postgraduate books will not give you so many syndromes in this format. So please appreciate this uh, uh, this YouTube video and make a note of it so that if you have to revise it, you can come back and look at this video for your revision. It's going to be very useful just before the exam. If you don't have time to read the, watch the whole, the entire video, just the first two slides. One, which tells you which other, which other syndromes are recessive or X-linked or dominant and which causes conductive or sensory or you know, mixed hearing loss, right? So with this, I will end this uh, video here. I thank you for joining this. It was my pleasure teaching you. I wish you all the best for future. I really hope that you do very well in your exams. And this is my name, Dr. Sanjay Gwal. So I'll meet you again in future. So bye, good night. Take a very good care of yourselves. Thank you. <clears throat>